The pre-draft process is shrouded in mystery, especially for the Seahawks, but we're going to try to predict John Schneider's big board heading towards the first round in a couple weeks in Detroit on our latest edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined here on Blue Friday by my co-host, Nick Lee, and a special thanks to all the 12s that are tuning in out there. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Whether you're tuning in from Augusta, Georgia, or San Antonio, Texas, we appreciate each and every one of you. Drawing ever closer to the NFL draft, it is full pre-draft season here at Locked On Seahawks. We're going to continue our position-by-position preview with edge rushers and defensive ends. We might even get some big ends in today's discussion as well. Jam-packed episode coming your way courtesy of FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers Get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now for your lead story here on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This time of year, even though most of the hay is in the barn, teams are still finalizing their big boards, and that's no exception for John Schneider, who probably is tweaking his big board the morning of the first round, knowing him. And this is a process that's always fluid. So keeping that in mind, Nick, you and I decided with less than two weeks before the draft that it was time to put on our genie caps, so to speak. And let's look into the crystal ball and let's try to predict what that top 10 big board in the first round looks like for John Schneider. And I'm going to give you the mic here first. And you've got somebody here topping off our list that, it's a position the Seahawks drafted in the first round a year ago, and yet you think that this particular player would pique interest for John Schneider. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the Seahawks have a pedigree with, with the secondary, and we were talking before the show, and, you know, it's not like the Seahawks have four or five corners that are signed, you know, long-term. You know, there's going to be a need there eventually. And so cornerback Kool-Aid McKinstry, I think, is one that to, to look at. Yes, that there's probably going to be some some – hand wringing and eye rolling and or worse if if this does happen but I could absolutely be talked into it I mean Kool-Aid McKinstry is one of the better corner prospects in this draft I mean just look at he's I love bringing up their pro football focus like the the percentile charts and if everyone's in the far right in the blue that's like high percentile for all the all the abilities his whole chart is blue like he everything he is a very very well-rounded corner he can tackle in the run run game too. He's bounced around a little bit, played some box, played some slot. So um, Kool-Aid McKinstry is one of the one of the better prospects. So if he if he falls to 16, or maybe if, even if the Seahawks trade back, I think might might be a little bit more palatable. <laughs> if maybe they get to 20 or 21 and he's still there, that would be a, a great addition to already a, a pretty solid secondary. Yeah, I think he's a player that would pique John Schneider's interest and Mike McDonald because you mentioned how he's moved around. He's played a bunch of different roles. They are looking for that versatility in the secondary. At number nine, this might surprise some of our listeners, but you and I agreed on this. Jackson Powers Johnson, who's played center for the most part in college, I don't know that John Schneider is going to be quite as eager to pick a guy who has one year of starting experience and has mostly played center when they do like Olu Olu with Timmy. That being said, he has played guard. This guy had a great week at the Senior Bowl, so I still think he is going to be on the big board, but Maybe not as high as some fans think he would be. So I've got him at number nine. There's a lot to like about him. I just wonder there are some, maybe not red flags, but white flags you can look at here a little bit where you're just wondering, is he going to be able to start right away? Where are we going to plug him in at? Is he going to be able to play at guard? So there's some question marks there. Beige with, flags. Yeah, there's 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 some yeah, there's some things that need to be addressed there first. And at number eight, you want to talk about a Play, piece of Play-Doh that has to be molded. Chop Robinson, I don't know that there's anybody in this draft that fits that bill better. And those kind of prospects can be kind of scary because obviously, Nick, 
Chop Robinson's coming to the league with never having more than four and a half sacks in a season in college. So you're not talking about a guy that had prolific production in that regard, but he was in the top 13 in pass rush win rate last year at Penn State. He was a nuisance getting in the backfield. You don't find athletes of this caliber off the edge. He's still a baby, just 21 years old. So we know Josh Schneider loves freak athletes and he loves guys with potential. So I actually see Chop Robinson being a little bit ahead of Jackson Powers Johnson here just because the enticement of a player like that who can really get after it off the edge. I don't know that Josh Schneider could pass up on that, especially after a trade down. Yeah, the two guys or the next guy on this list um, and the guy after that are could, couldn't be more different. But I think both are really intriguing. Graham Barton is one of my favorite offensive line prospects in this first round. Um, I've mocked him a few times to the Seahawks and and just getting him to switch inside, obviously, to, to possibly guard or even center, perhaps. Um, just he's just mean. He's he's a pretty decent athlete. He's a load. He's got the anchor. I mean, he's got everything you want in an offensive lineman. He's he grades out well in just about any aspect you'd like from an offensive lineman. Um, pretty decent athlete for his size, too. Um, and, and so Graham Barton is one guy I think that I, I would really like to see them, uh, you know, upgrade the interior. And then on the other side of the coin, as, as far as, you know, pro profile, Cooper DeGene from Iowa. I mean, forgive the low-hanging fruit, um, but I think he could be like the Taysom Hill of the secondary. Like he can bounce around. He's got the high IQ. High, I know it's super low-hanging fruit got, for got obvious reasons. BYU references. I had to do that, and you know, you know, I, I get, I get the low-hanging fruit for other reasons too. But he's got the high IQ, the high athlete. He he could learn any position in the secondary. Um, so as far as a Swiss Army knife kind of goes for for Cooper DeGene, I could see that being really intriguing. Yeah, I've got him high on the list here compared to, say, Kool-Aid McKinstry just because of the safety value and the fact that this guy had the ball production that he did. Three interceptions returned for touchdowns in 2022. He is the textbook definition of ball hawk and a playmaking ball hawk at that. Now, going to our top five, there's a lot of defensive linemen. In fact, the, the first four that we've got here are all defensive linemen. And some of our listeners might be wondering, why is that the case? Well, look, Seattle is going to be looking for the best player available. And I think that this is the sweet spot, that 16 to 25 range, where you may, able to, may be able to get a blue chip caliber defensive lineman. Liatu Latu, who started his college career at Washington, then went to UCLA. You want to talk about a technician, Nick. This is a guy that has as well-rounded of a set of pass rushing moves you're going to find the productions off the charts the pass rush win rate is off the charts really the only reason he's not higher is there is the concern about his neck but he played the last two years and everything I've been told suggests that teams are feeling pretty good about that situation so if the Seahawks signed off on that Latu who has the background playing at Washington previously bringing back to the Pacific Northwest I think would make a lot of sense and then next up on the list this one's easy for me. Byron Murphy the second. I mean, he's had a combine visit and a top 30 visit. The Seahawks are clearly interested in him. He was a running back in high school before he ate himself out of the position. And he is a phenomenal athlete that can penetrate gaps. And I just feel like this is a guy that's just scratching the surface of his potential. So have him come in at number four on Schneider's list because I have a feeling that that is a guy that's going to be in that upper echelon of players where if he's there at 16, John Schneider might have a difficult time trading down. Yeah, in the first round, you're drafting a defensive lineman. You're going to want a guy that's a three-down guy. And Byron Murphy absolutely is a three-down guy. And other guy as well is, uh, is Johnny Newton, Jerson Newton, there from Illinois. He's 300 pounds and quick as a hiccup. I don't know how that's possible. but he, um, and I've watched plenty of Illinois tape. You've watched plenty of Illinois tape looking for you know Devin Witherspoon stuff. And like, who is this single-digit just like – Planet Watch. Jupiter in the middle, <laughs> and and there he is. And Newton is is just a uh, he's just got a nose for the football. And then of course I, I think what we can agree are the, are the blue chip as far as what is attainable at sixteen a blue chip I don't, uh, edge guy at Jared Verse. I think Jared Verse is is one of the more well rounded um, you know edge defenders that the Seahawks could possibly get at sixteen. He still could be gone by then. Who knows? Um, but if he's he's got the production. He's got, got the athleticism. So I think Jared Verse is uh, is probably your top defender you could possibly get if he falls that low. But then, of course, there's number one. Yeah, Troy Fotanu, who maybe is the most unlikely of this list of players to be there at 16, but we've seen crazier things happen. 
you've obviously got the link between him and Ryan Grubb and Scott Huff from being at Washington, a phenomenal athlete for his size, could play both tackle spots. But I think he would be a guard, obviously, in Seattle. But the other reason that this guy is number one on the list, if John Schneider is going to draft a guard this early, it's got to be a guy that's a hedge for Charles Cross or Abraham Lucas, and he can play both tackle positions. I mean, Charles Cross has two years, maybe three, if they pick up the 50 year option left in his rookie deal. If you don't see a big leap from him this year, the Seahawks might start floating around some trade offers and saying, you know what? Troy Fontana was a stud tackle. We're going to move him out to tackle and take over on the left side. This would give you a lot of flexibility. I've been told if he's there at 16 that the Seahawks are going to have a very difficult time trading down because the coaching staff is going to be begging for him to be picked. And obviously they need guards. Plug this guy in day one at guard. You could have a lot of fun. So I think you and I would be in agreement from John Schneider's perspective. The versatility, the athlete, the pedigree, the coaching staff clamoring for this guy. Troy Fotanu would be the home run slam dunk if he is there at number 16. He and Verse, I think, have a really good chance to be gone, maybe even in the top 10 picks. But if either one of them's there, then John Schneider is going to be licking his chops. He's going to have a very difficult time trading down in that instance. Up next, we're going to shift gears to the latest position in our 2024 NFL draft, draft preview. We're going to be looking at edge rushers and defensive ends. Don't go away. You're listening to the Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience is what brings home the winning trophy, and it also keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance, whether it's superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. If you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you're always going to find exactly what you're looking for. And thanks to eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time of your money back. With eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. You're listening to the Blue Friday edition of Locked on Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined for today's show by my co-host, Nick Lee. And a special thanks to all the 12s tuning in. Thank you for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Continuing our 2024 NFL Draft Preview a couple days ago, Rob Rang and I looked at the big and heavies in the middle, the defensive tackles. Now it's time to go to the athletes that had some really big athletes in this group as well. The edge rushers and defensive ends in this year's class. And Nick, we've name dropped a couple of these guys already with our big board. And I want to start off discussing the play of somebody that we haven't talked about that I actually think might be the first edge off the board. I personally am higher on Jared Verse because I think he's a better all-around player, but this is a pass-driven league now, and you're looking for athletes that can get off the ball and wreak havoc, and that's exactly what Dallas Turner does. We're talking about a guy with 4-4 speed off the edge, 10 sacks last year, a couple of forced fumbles, he was extremely productive against really good tackles in the SEC. Not the best run defender, but he's also not somebody that you're going to have to take out of the lineup necessarily. It's not that big of a weakness, and I think he can still grow into his frame a little bit and become a better run defender in time. But, man, the twitchiness off the edge. I don't know that there's a twitchier edge rusher in this class, and his ability to get after the quarterback, those kind of flashy players go early in the draft, and – if Dallas Turner were to fall to the Seahawks at 16, again, I don't think it's going to happen, but this is the kind of athlete that John Schneider may have a difficult time passing up on. Yeah, if, there, if, if there's a blue chip kind of all around better edge that is a better run defender than Dallas Turner, it, it is Jared Verse. Um, that we, we mentioned him already. Got the He checks pretty much every box. He's got the production college, back-to-back -back nine sack seasons, 29 and a half tackles for loss over the last two seasons. He's got – he's a – Grades out as a pretty decent run defender, twitchy athlete. I think the only knock on Jared Verse would be he doesn't quite have that elite, elite length or size. Um, maybe perhaps a, a Dallas Turner has the edge there. 
Um, but as far as just the technician and just and the well-roundedness, Jared Verse, I think, wins out there. And then speaking of well-rounded, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Leatu Latu, um, which is really fun to say, by the way. Um, talk about well-rounded. 23 and a half sacks, 34 tackles for loss the last two years. High motor, good technician, sheds blocks quickly, got the ideal size. I mean, if you'll forgive the, the golf reference on Masters Week, um, he's got everything in the back. He's got the he he got he's got the bomb driver. He's got the precision around the green. He's got the chipping, the putting, the you know, he can get on the green. He's got anything. He, there's no shot he can't make, so to speak. He's got everything there. And like you mentioned in the in the first segment, <clears throat> excuse me, a little frog in my throat today. Well, hopefully um, you didn't swallow a fly like I did on yesterday's <laughs> show. No, nothing that bad. Uh, but, I mean, really the only knock on on Latu being perhaps one of the uh, premier, premier uh, edge defender uh, prospects is, is that health record. But looks like he's kind of put that behind him at UCLA. Yeah, he has put that injury behind him. Not that it hasn't been a discussion point in this process. Teams obviously were – uh, they knew about this and they were trying to figure out everything they could about it. But again, I've heard that generally teams are feeling pretty good about his health. We just talked about three guys that are coming into the league with really good production. And then you've got Chop Robinson, who I mentioned the last segment for a moment, who may have the highest ceiling of any of these four. And GMs, these are the kind of players that general managers can get fired for drafting because if they don't become the player that you believe that they can – and they flatline, again, you waste a first-round pick on a guy like this, and these are the kind of moves that can get you looking for a new job. It can get you a pink slip. But at the same time, it also could be one that can get you executive of the year if you hit on a pick like this because Robinson has all of the physical tools. And the film is better than the stats. I'm just saying. You're talking about a guy that gets after it with an explosive rush off the edge. He's got some really good power off of his speed rush. There's more counter moves than you would expect. And I think he's a better run defender at this stage than what people would anticipate. Last year, average depth of the tackle of negative one, which was number one in the country for edge defenders. So I'm high on him. I wouldn't draft him at 16 just because I think it's a little bit scary to pick somebody like this there. But if you trade down and he's still there, he absolutely has to be in the mix as a guy that you would consider drafting. Now, looking at day two, the first guy I'm going to talk about our colleague Rob Rang would probably be laughing like this guy's a first round pick, but I still got him as an early day two selection. And that's Darius Robinson out of Missouri, a massive human being, Nick, six foot five, 285 pounds, very productive last year, kind of a late bloomer at Missouri, had eight and a half sacks last year, had never had more than three in a season leading up to last year. That always scares me a little bit. And yet, he could be a guy like a boy, Mafe, in the sense that the light switch came on. He was raw. Light switch came on. Now coming into the league, he's got a chance to really take off in the NFL. He's got really long arms. He's a physical thumper with his hands, plays outstanding run defense. I'm not sure you're going to see a lot of sacks from him at the next level as an edge because he only ran a 4.9540. He's not the most explosive guy. He had Mike Morris type numbers in the combine, but at the same time, this is a guy that if you slide him inside, somebody's that versatile piece that you can move around the line. That's where the sacks come into play. So I think there is the potential for him to be a first round caliber guy, but I do have some reservations about the athleticism and the pass rushing. And day two, you start to kind of lose the immediate plug and play three down kind of defensive lineman. Um, for, for me, Brandon Dorless from Oregon is, is another one that's really intriguing. Could be more of a pass rush specialist, at least to start out. Bounced all over Oregon's defensive line. Actually took 253 snaps uh, this past season at three tech and could be a valuable piece as, you know, a guy that you can bounce around, not just as a, you know, five tech to loosely quote Booger McFarland <laughs> with this guy's size. He's a, he's a Popeye's biscuit away from being a three tech, which, <laughs> you know, is not a bad thing necessarily. I mean, with, with some of the moves and some of the, you know, some of the things in his repertoire, that's not a, that's not a knock. You know, maybe Booger was using that as a knock, but for me that I think that's, that could be a good thing. So having a guy that kind of grades out as perhaps a five tech uh, defensive end, but maybe can slide him inside and, and use some of those skill set. Another guy that's kind of in that um, same ballpark, so to speak, and also um, you know part of UW. We've talked about UW a lot. Braylon, Tr Braylon Trice, sixteen sacks the last two years. Great motor. Um, he gets some of those second efforts uh, sacks. Good pad level. Sound fundamentals. Not the most elite of athletes. I'm, this is my last golf reference of the day. 
Uh, this will be it. Um, he's he's that guy where guys will probably drive it farther than him. They they probably got more power, but he's gonna be he's gonna beat him around the green. He's gonna beat him with the chipping. He's gonna get putts. He's a technician. He's he's got that short game, so to speak. He's he's more of a technician than a big power guy. I could definitely see Mike McDonald liking Doorless or Trice, perhaps to you know bounce him around the the defensive line, different spots, pick some spots to do some stunts. I think a guy like Mike McDonald would enjoy one of Doorless or or Trice in those kind of situations. I want to switch gears here to my poor man's version of Jadevian Clowney, and that might seem like lofty praise for a day two pick, but Marshawn Nealand is one of my favorite prospects in this draft class. When you turn on the film, this dude plays a violent brand of football, not in a bad way. Like we're not talking to guy after the whistle that's doing things. I mean, he just after the snap throws violent hands 83 and a quarter inch wingspan, really long arm, 6'3", 267, not quite as big as Darius Robinson, but he ran in the mid four sevens. So he's a very good athlete for his size. I don't think that this is a player that's going to get you a ton of sacks consistently. So that's where I kind of see some parallels with Jadevian Clowney, whose sack numbers have been inconsistent in his career. This is a guy that I could see having a few seasons where he's able to get more in that category, but he's going to consistently give you pressure and he is going to set a firm edge. This guy is a really good run defender that knows how to stack and shed blocks and get off those blocks quickly, make plays in the backfield. And I was impressed by his football IQ when I interviewed him at the combine. So Marshawn Nealon's a player that I'm very high on late Mid round three range. I mean, Seattle picks at 81. Maybe Marshawn Nealon is a good fit there if he is available at that spot. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Chris Braswell, he played with Dallas Turner at Alabama last year, it was his only year as a starter, had eight sacks. He's 251 pounds. I don't see him at least initially being an every down defender. This guy would fit the bill as a situational pass rusher that needs to learn how to better deploy his counter moves. He's got a wide array of pass rush moves. He just doesn't always know how to use them in practice efficiently. So there's some development that needs to happen there. I look at him as being somebody that's late third round because he has athleticism. There's pass rushing production. He's coming from Alabama. But I think in Seattle's case, this might be a little more repetitive in terms of having another Daryl Taylor kind of player because his run defense was spotty, but maybe you can groom him in that regard. One guy who's a bit maybe graded a bit better in run defense is Adiza Isaac out of Penn State. I guess you could call him the Robin to <laughs> Chop Robinson's Batman. I guess at at, uh, at Beaver Stadium. But I, I like the I love the uh, you know the, the team captain high motor types that also are pretty good athletes. He's got violent quick hands, good separation. Um, he might lack in true like anchor strength and weight. He's a lower percentile for weight. But he's got a pretty good, uh, pretty good athleticism. Higher percentile for his position for forty and, and shuttle and broad jump. So you know he's going to be a good athlete. I just like, I like the mix of a high motor, high character, high technician, and I think that's what Adiza Isaac is. When we come back, we are going to switch gears to the day three sleepers. This is not an overly deep class at the defensive end edge positions, and yet there could be some gems that can be uncovered. In rounds four through seven, Nick and I are going to dive into six prospects to keep an eye on with sleeper potential at the edge and outside linebacker spots when we return here on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You're listening to the Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host, Nick Lee. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you for tuning in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week, whether you are listening while watching the Masters or not. We appreciate each and every one of you. Continuing to dive into this year's edge and defensive end outside linebacker prospects. Really, you can clutter all three of those positions into one group. It just depends on the scheme that you're going to be playing in. Let's get to our day three sleepers. And I'll admit, Nick, this is not the deepest edge class that we've seen. I think that there's a significant significant drop off even after day one. I think you've got your three or four really good blue chip caliber guys. And then there's some solid players on day two. Day three, you're going to be looking for those guys that have traits or they have one or two skills that are clearly NFL caliber. And you're going to be taking a shot on them. 
Who are some day three guys that jump out to you that could be good fits for the Seahawks to either take a flyer on or look as potential early on rotational defenders? I'll start with two here. So uh, twin brother of Gabriel is Grayson Murphy at UCLA. 18 tackles for loss and 10 sacks the last two years. I like that versatility there. Strong bull rush. Um, not an elite athlete, not twitchy, but gets it done with some brute strength. He, he also is upper percentile in run stop win rates, which I really like. Um, but yeah, you might like that, might lack that true size that you're looking for, but he makes up for it with some strength and some and some athleticism for that size. So I've um, got to keep an eye on for sure. And then one of my favorites, Corbin, at least late in the draft, maybe not to your Marshawn Neeland uh, crush status, but I love Mo Camara from Colorado State. I really do. I mean, obviously, right off the bat, he's six foot one, which is below fifth percentile for for NFL edge rushers. Um, it's immediate concern. Thirty two and three eighth inch arms. Uh, for reference, Boy Mafe is six four, and Chenna Nwosu I think has thirty three and five eighth inch arms. So obviously, he'd be in the on the shorter, stockier side uh, of an edge rusher per se. But that also could mean a few things. He has elite pad level <laughs> already at six one. When you're facing, you know, six five, six six tackles. 13 sacks and 17 tackles for loss the last two years. Uh, or sorry, last year. Last year, single season. 13 sacks and 17 tackles for loss at Colorado State in one year. is fabulous. Compact, strong. Um, obviously, the length and the anchoring is a concern. Maybe Obviously, that's, you know, he probably won't be a three-down lineman. You know, he's got some room to grow. Or not room to grow physically, but at least some room to, to develop other things. And But higher than 90th percentile in pass rush win rate. A, a true pass rush specialist technician. I really like um, some of the traits I've seen. Obviously there's going to be some work to do as a possible day three pick. He's not a plug and play, you know, instant three down guy, but a, 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 a instant, perhaps juice, uh, juice bringer on the, on the uh, pass rush side, maybe develop him later on as a, as a run guy. See if you can get him in the, in there with, uh, with three downs, but Mo Kamara is a guy I really want to take, take a look at day three. And I think putting him in a three, four where he's standing up most of the time that would help mitigate some of those length concerns right. because of his ability to discard from blocks. That would give him time to be able to get his hands into blockers and then shed. I think that that would also help with the run defense aspect. He's definitely, in my mind, not a traditional 4-3 end, unless you're going to be running a lot of wide nines. I do think that there are some scheme fit issues. But in Seattle, I, I think that this system would fit well with him. As far as my day three guys, I want to start off, here on day three guys with Javon Solomon from Troy and every year Nick there's a handful of non-power five programs that for whatever reason they kick out two or three really solid pro prospects and Troy fits that bill this year I've raved about Kamani Vidal the stud running back here on the show frequently I think that he's a I, this is my opinion. I've got a round three grade on him. I think he goes on day three, though, because generally it seems like that's where he's at. But he is a stud. But the other player on their team in this draft, that the more film I watched, I became incredibly intrigued, was Javon Solomon. We're talking about a guy that had 16 sacks last season by himself. He is wow. an outstanding pass rusher that has a nice array of developed counter moves. He's only 246 pounds, so he's got to be that stand-up outside 3-4 linebacker, but Seattle is going to be deploying a defense. He's going to use players like that. So I look at him, there's some questions about run defense, and yet the film that I watch, it's different than, say, when I've watched Daryl Taylor, where it's like he's constantly out of position or he's getting bullied. I, I don't see that on tape with Javon Solomon. Now, Grady's playing in the Sun Belt Conference, so it's – Less competition um, than you're going to see, say, in the SEC, places like that, inferior competition. But I see a guy that has some physicality. He has the one-two. He sheds blocks well. He plays with a tough demeanor. I think in the fourth or fifth round, Javon Solomon would be a really fun player to bring in. And as I view, being the replacement for Daryl Taylor, who's going to offer a more well-rounded game and potentially be an even better pass rusher because I think he's got a more versatile toolbox that he can work with. On the other side of the coin, Jalex Hunt from Houston Christian, who played at the FCS level, was a former safety, and he transitioned to pass rusher. So you can see the safety athleticism. This guy ran in the low four fives in the 40-yard dash at 250-plus pounds. 
He had a good week at the Senior Bowl. Houston Christian does not get Senior Bowl invites really ever. So this was a guy that caught the attention of our buddy Jim Nagy, the director of the Senior Bowl, and the rest of their staff. And he had a good week there. I think he is a developmental project midday three that you're going to be asking a lot to get him many snaps as a rookie. And yet there could be a ceiling there with proper development where he might be able to be a really good backup or even a mid-level starter at some point if you can develop his array of tools into a well-rounded football player. He's just very raw. He's sushi raw coming into the NFL. So uh, this is a guy that I think in middle of day three might be worth the risk because of the athletic tools, but a very undeveloped player that only had four sacks last year. I think we just found a new like tier name for day three pick sushi raw. I like that. Um, Brennan Jackson from Wazoo. So we're, we're sticking with the local flavor here. Um, just looking at the, at the film things I've read um, some of the best like motor level efforts of the entire draft. I mean, he is just a high, high motor, high effort guy. Um, unfortunately he does have to make up for that or he has to use that to make up for some other you know um, cons in his game. But, um, he, he's pretty strong, got some good leverage. He's not like he's probably middle of the pack as far as strength goes for that position. Has a few counter moves in his repertoire. Um, I think where, where he lacks is that elite athlete, elite bend. Um, he might do nicely as a you know a, a project, you know, five tech kind of guy, um, quick, but and he's he's I think he had like a four, six, nine, forty, which for for a maybe a five tech guy is, is not bad at all. So um, if Brendan Jackson's a guy I'd like to take a flyer on later on, and, and this would certainly be you know in the back half, maybe you know five, six, or even seventh round if he's there um, as another guy to, to kind of stash, see what you got there. Um, you like the high motor, high energy, high effort, and you know with some traits mixed in, see what you can do with that. I'm going to wrap up this segment with somebody that Mike McDonald knows very well. And that's Jalen Harrell, who actually played for McDonald as one year's defensive coordinator at Michigan. And there are a couple other Michigan defensive linemen that could be in the mix for the Seahawks during this draft. But I look at Jalen Harrell, he's 250 pounds. He's a little bit light, especially in the lower half, but yet you see some physicality and you see the ability to defend the run on film. I mean, Michigan was not going to play guys that couldn't defend the run. You were not going to play. So this guy has good technique at 250 pounds, ran in the high four sixes. So not the most explosive athlete at 250 pounds, but still a respectable 40 time, had a 37 inch vertical, had to wait really till his junior season, his redshirt junior season to really get many reps on defense, had six and a half sacks, double G tackles for a loss last year. This is a player that I still feel like his best football may be in front of him because he had to wait so long to get in the field with all the talent that Michigan kicks out to the NFL every year. And the fact that he already has that built-in relationship with Mike McDonald, I don't see him going until mid to late day three just because the sack numbers aren't necessarily there. He isn't that super flashy athlete. The tape is good, if unspectacular, but I see this being a guy where you would have some continuity there with the coaching staff. And I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there, given the lack of snaps that he had until the last few years at Michigan. He's coming from a program that kicks out pro-ready players as well. So Harrell is one of those high-floor type guys that might have a higher ceiling than anticipated just because of that experience element. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Nick at Nick Lee 51 Make sure to subscribe to Locked on Seahawks on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on Monday, we've got two Mock Draft Mondays left. We're going to be diving into the latest rounds of Mock Drafts, and we're going to be continuing our preview. We're going to switch back to the offensive side of the football, and we're going to be tackling some tackle prospects on the offensive line. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy your weekend, and thanks for listening. Go Hawks!